The climate is changing. Oceans are warming. Extreme weather is more common. Threatened species are under strain. Whether we accept it or not, it's happening. What we might do about it is up to us. We're on borrowed time. I'm Andrew Murphy of the Mill Valley Public Library, here today on behalf of the Borrow Time series with Nathaniel Rich. Nathaniel is the author of the novels King Zeno, Odds Against Tomorrow, and The Marist Tongue. He writes for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and the New York Review of Books, and is also the author of two nonfiction works, San Francisco Noir, and the book we'll be discussing today, Losing Earth, A Recent History. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'd like to start with, as you put it, a trick question. What has been the largest physics discovery relating to climate change since 1979? Right. Well, I, it's yeah, it's a question that's posed by um, Ken Ken Caldera uh, in Stanford to his graduates, one of the, the leading <clears throat> climate scientists, at, um, to his his first year graduate students. Every year, he asks, um, you know, what 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 have been the uh, yeah, progressions in, in our fundamental understanding of climate change. And of course, it's a, since in the last four years, it's a trick question because there haven't been any. Um, you know, since, since consensus was, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, essentially ratified uh, by the end of 1979 through a series of um, government reports, um, sort of high level academic. Uh, reports contributed to by a, a wide array of scientists in very various geophysical fields. Uh, there hasn't been any major um, shift in the way we understand the climate problem. All that we have learned, um, which is a considerable amount, but essentially has uh, the understanding that materialized then. Yeah, we have more precise measurements and more precise predictions of where things are headed, but the basic picture uh, hasn't hasn't shifted. And as you so disturbingly put it, the estimates from back then are now the data. Yes, they've 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 been realized, and um, the yeah we have now have the numbers to to back it up. Of course, it didn't take thirty or forty years. Um, you know, for for that data to be confirmed, even by the end of the 1980s, um, when you know James Hansen, the NASA scientist, who's one of the main figures in the book, starts to um, gain global recognition uh, as the the face of uh, climate science, basically after testifying before Congress, he at the time is already saying that um, you know what was a theory about uh, you know warming. Uh, can now be found in the global uh, temperature records. You know, he's saying this as early as 1988, that, that you know, we now have proof. Um, of course, that, that proof is, you know, mounted now for three additional decades uh, since then in, in ever more alarming um, fashion. Yeah, and I hope that most people listening have already heard at least in passing um, a little bit about Jim Hansen, but if not that, at least that oil companies have been aware of the threats of climate change since the late 70s. And your book, uh, a key point in your book is just to share the history of um, the knowledge of this issue, um, even predating that, um, dating back to the, the 50s, people were writing about this possibility. Um, so in the most simple of terms, um, and with what's happening in Australia right now in mind, why do our elected leaders continue to deny the science? Well, I mean, that's, that's the story that essentially began you know, at the end of the, of the period I wrote about, which is beginning in 1988-89, the oil and gas industry took it upon itself to uh, develop uh, public policy, uh, strategy about about climate change and and this, this, this threat of global warming 
in the face of, of just a, a ton of um, legislation that was being introduced in Congress uh, that year, those years, um, and uh, they began you know, little um, disinformation campaign, uh, you know, public uh, influence campaign, um, spending you know millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on. Um, trying to uh, poison the public debate about uh, climate policy, uh, trying to sow disinformation, trying to uh, bribe politicians, uh, and largely succeeding. So I think I think you know any analysis of of our paralysis has to has to begin with with that campaign, which has been remarkably. Successful. Um, what was striking to me in writing about the period I wrote about 79 to 1989 is that, as you say, you know, the oil and gas industry was well aware of what was going on. They were an active participant in the, the, the science at the time. They had, you know, research divisions at Exxon and the American Petroleum Institute dedicated to monitoring the carbon dioxide problem, as it was then known. Uh, but they didn't have a uh, robust or coordinated um, public policy campaign. There was no formulated agenda uh, at the highest levels as they're developed later later on to try to thwart any kind of meaningful legislation, of course, in part because there wasn't any you know meaningful legislation that had been proposed at that earlier time. Um, but what's striking about that period is that uh, with even without this this major antagonistic force, um, you know using all of the resources at its disposal, to, to thwart any kind of progress, uh, we still failed to pass um, major climate policy. We, we failed to ratify a powerful uh, global treaty uh, that was, you know, that emerged by the end of the decade. Um, and in many cases, you know, we failed even to make serious statements of purpose um, within the realm and also really within the scientific realm as well. And, and, and that to me was, was even almost a more haunting uh, element of the story because of, you know, we know, you know, we know who the villains have been since then, but uh, you know, the, the fact that we weren't able to come to some kind of resolve uh, even before those villains, you know, presented themselves and reared their ugly heads um, that that I find more troubling, and that that's really the subject of the main subject of the book. You know, why why did we fail uh, during this period when when we had as good of a chance to see as as we've ever had since? And one thing you also cover in your book is the success for uh, the response to the fear of the hole in the ozone. Um, in comparison, why haven't we made, or why didn't we make? Um, progress with climate change at the time. Right. The, the, there's, there is this, this, um, you know, the story moves through several phases of, um, you know, I guess it's, there's sort of one step forward, two steps back over the course of the decade. And, and I, you know, I, I tell you the, the, the individual, you know, personal stories of a couple of, of people who are really on the vanguard of trying to move, uh, the science into into policy. Jim Hansen and also Rafe Rafe Pomerantz is an activist. They think it's simply enough just to tell the world, you know, what's going on, and that once politicians and you know, powerful people in D.C. understood uh, the threat, that they would some sense of common decency or prudence or or you know rational thought would would start to take some some measures uh, to do something about it. You know, after several years of of trying uh, and failing to advance the their agenda of trying to, to get people to pay attention to climate change and, and do something about it, um, the the figures I'm writing about, Rafe Palmer and James Hansen, were were stymied, and and it wasn't until the ozone problem came along uh, that they found um, a way forward, which was to say. Um, you know, to model their their campaign after the campaign to um, solve the ozone crisis, and the ozone crisis was this anxiety that um, you know the, there was a hole in the ozone layer, that the the sun, um, you know, there were these images in the public 
uh, press of the sun burning through the atmosphere and giving people skin cancer and making them even go blind and and all kinds of other health problems. And this really galvanized, um, you know, the public and also the politicians to do something about it. And they signed a, a global uh, environmental treaty, the, the first of its kind, um, to try to reduce emissions of CFCs, uh, the chemical, man-made chemicals that cause uh, the ozone hole uh, to form. And the, uh, the climate people, the carbon, you know, the global warming people, realized right away that that they needed to to speak about uh, global warming in in the same kind of visceral um, manner that the, that the people who were talking about worried about the ozone hole uh, were using and 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 pretty soon um, that strategy worked they were ba- they were able to piggyback on the ozone hole issue uh, and for the rest of the decade they they um, made a lot of progress. So you you just use in the expression one step forward, two steps back. I was curious to know how you feel about some of um, the current goals, different cities, states, or setting in countries even to have carbon neutral goals by 2050. Um, even though it is a step forward to kind of have these goals seems that the science is already saying that's not fast enough. Um, so do you think having these goals by, even if we can meet them by 2050 is, um, adequate? I think the only, the only rational response, uh, to the threat that we face now is to accelerate as, as much as, possible towards zero emissions. Um, you know, I think, well, will goals passed by cities or states um, or towns help us there? I think perhaps, um, you know, I think the goals set by the Paris Accord, um, you know, including by some of the most well-intentioned, progressive-minded uh, uh, nations, uh, you know they have already mi- have already missed their for early targets on those. So I think one has to not you know ha- judge any 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 such goals with some skepticism. But I think the 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 bottom line is that um, we need to do the maximum possible as quickly as as possible. Um, there's you know I think there's a there's something um, almost infantile in the way that that uh, at least in the public conception that global warming has become a kind of, you know, a battle that we will win or lose. Um, of course, there's a wide range of outcomes available to us. Uh, and there's an enormous, um, you know, differences, even not only between say, you know, two degrees warming and two and a half degrees warming, but even, you know, two degrees warming and 2.1 degrees warming. So, uh, there's a wide spectrum available to us. The best case scenario is still not so great, um, but there's but there's a huge difference between that and the worst case scenario. Uh, so I think um, anything short of the most aggressive measures uh, taken now is, is insufficient. Uh, I think I think certainly uh, this has to be the the highest goal of any government policy, whether local, state, um, you know, or, or national or international. And you mentioned the Paris um, Accord, and in your book you covered the 1989 conference in the Netherlands, but you also note that treaties are for show without actions or consequences. Do you have any hope that that could change, or what will make that change? Yeah, there's a certain you know, real politic uh, problem with treaties. And this is something that, you know, political scientists uh, were talking about, you know, as early as, as the, the late seventies. And I write about some of, some of these figures in, in, in losing earth that there's, there's a great, um, 
distrust of of the uh, effectiveness of any kind of global theory because there's always um, stronger incentives to not live up to the level of an accord, um, especially one that can't be enforced. Um, and the Paris, you know, the Paris Agreement, of course, is voluntary. It, it's it's the weakest possible um, level of of enforcement. Um, and so, the uh, yeah, I mean, I think I have some skepticism about it. On the other hand, um, you know, I'm not I'm not convinced there's any single pathway. I think I think there's um, it's better to have countries, you know, making commitments than not. It's better to have international pressure uh, and the pressure of of living up to um, you know agreements with other countries than not. Um, but certainly we, you know, we need more than treaties. We need a massive, uh, shift in the way we produce energy, uh, which is to say a massive shift in the way our economy that happened in, in the short term, we not, um, but there is no, uh, you know, there, there is no point at which we can't, um, you know, at which it's too late to avoid even worse uh, scenarios. And so, um, you know, I think it's incumbent on anyone who considers well, you know, themselves a responsible member of, of society, of, of humanity, to do everything in their power uh, to bring pressure on, um, on, on the political process and on, on politicians to act. And that doesn't just mean, you know, to try to convince Republicans to take it up, but to convince Democrats that this should be the highest, highest priority um, in uh, of their office. On that note, I'm curious, like, what you think of, say, somebody like Greta Thunberg, who says, I don't want your hope, I want you to panic. Um, does that give you hope, seeing... Um, or a different way of asking that is, do you think her message will be effective? I think her message already has been effective, and I think it's the message of this new wave of youth activism, um, you know, which extends to the Sunrise Movement in the U.S. Um, and to some extent, Extinction Rebellion. Um, and I, I think what's 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 striking about this this new activism is that it it's it, it seems to prof- it has profoundly shifted the discourse and it's for the first time really since uh Rafe Palmer and St. James Hansen and and their colleagues started talking about the problem in 1979 uh in, in the public um you know starting with them the argument has been the argument from environmentalists environment uh, argument from people who care about climate change has been essentially uh, an appeal to reason. It's been to say, you know, we know the science, we know what's happening, uh, we know what's going to happen, we know we better act now before it's too late, um, and it's it's irrational not to start taking action now. Uh, that's basically been the rhetorical line, and you see it throughout the 80s, you know, picking up and... Um, you know, energy and sort of pitch. Uh, but that's, that's the argument that goes through the eighties. It's the argument you see from Al Gore, uh, almost 20 years later and inconvenient truth. Of course, he's making the same argument during the eighties as well when he's in, in Congress. Um, and it's, you know, there he's saying, we have the science, here's even more data. Here's even more, um, you know, more slides and photographs and videos of, of the ramifications of climate change, you know, now don't you understand it's, you know, how crazy it is not to act. Um, and it's really what you saw through the last election. Um, what the, the young activists now uh, are doing is they're making a different kind of argument. Um, of course, they don't, you know, of course, they agree that it's crazy not to act. But they are saying things like, um, you know, you are stealing our, our future away from us. Usually it's directed at the older generation, you know, people in power politically or economically, you know, at, you see Greta Thunberg at, at Davos saying, you know, you're stealing our future away from us. Uh, you are killing our, our dreams. You are, you're killing us. Um, this is, a, you know, this is, 
they're putting a gun, a loaded gun to our heads, um, and so on. And, and that's a, that's a moral claim. That's, that's an argument to say that, um, not only is it stupid, but this is wrong. Uh, and, and furthermore, that our failure to respond to these problems, uh, as a society, um, it's not only you know immoral, but it it undermines all of the fundamental values that we claim as the basis for our our democracies and for for our civilization. Um, you know, you see it framed as a social justice issue by uh, the Sunrise Movement. I think that's exactly you know right. It's the only honest way to look at it. Uh, it's an understanding that uh, you know climate change disproportionately hurts uh, people who are. Uh, most ostracized or um, abused by our structures of government uh, and economics, um, that it discriminates against those who are already discriminated against. And that, you know, if we believe in equality, if we believe in, in fairness and in justice, um, in, uh, you know, fraternity, all, all of these sort of fundamental ideas that are the underpinnings of our society, uh, then we have no choice but to attack this problem as aggressively as possible because it undermines, um, you know, all of those values. It 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 makes the world less just, um, less equal. Um, you know, it exacerbates every form of inequality from you know, racial um, to wealth to age and so on. Uh, and so that's that's a very different kind of argument. It's it's a more emotional argument. I think it's a more profound argument, and I think it's already had a major effect on public opinion, on the political uh, scene, um, on the left and and on the right. And uh, the question, of course, as ever, is you know how quickly will this will this act upon the consciousness of of our nation, um, and, and of the world. But I think, um, you know, certainly, uh, it needs to, act, you know, the, the U S has to, has to take some leadership here. Um, and, and yeah, the question is how, you know, how long will it take for this issue to, uh, escape the bonds of, of, you know, politicization, this sort of artificial politicization that's been thrust upon it by, this industry campaign that's gone on for, for 30 years now. Right. And um, on the note of reason and insanity, you, you, in your book, you said our species has a tolerance for self delusion. <laughs> um, do, do you think we can save ourselves? Um, I, I think it's, I, I don't, I think it's sort of childish to talk about saving ourselves or not saving ourselves. I think we we're already locked into um, some pretty grim, scenarios uh but we also have uh enormous amount of uh power to shape um you know our, where 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 this ultimately ends up um and so to you know to think of it in binary terms in terms you know salvation or not um feels to me you know that it, it almost an, an immature phase of, of of understanding the problem it's um, you know, this, it, this isn't, a, you know, I think of it as an adult problem and, and we should think about it in adult terms. Um, and the, the, the sort of this kind of, um, Hollywood type framing of, you know, victory or, or defeat, um, you know, salvation or end of the world, I think has been, uh, has really hampered the, the dialogue in this country for, for a long time now. And it's, it's caused a kind of, um, it's created this kind of, you know, weird duality um, of, you know, should we be panicked? Should we be, you know, hope, hope or despair? Um, you know, I, I don't think other countries in the world think about it in this way. And in fact, I think some of the countries that have, have made the most progress on curbing carbon emissions are not, you know, countries in Northern Europe say, that aren't particularly optimistic about about the world or the future, and yet they have a more clear-eyed view of what must be done and how quickly it it, it must be done. Um, and so, I think we need to I think we need to challenge ourselves to 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 try to um, think of the issue with the, the sort of the gravity and 
and the nuance that it that it demands. I mean, we're talking about the future of civilization, and um, I, I think that we, uh, you know, we owe it to ourselves to to think uh, in a serious way about you know moving this process along as quickly as possible. Um, while acknowledging that we'll never move it at this point in the in the timeline, we'll never move it quickly enough to avoid um, everything we 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 want to avoid. So, would a, a better way of instead of um, hope or despair, or can we save it or not, win or lose, is would you say the conversation should be more about acceptance and adaptation? I think it it has to be about. I think adaptation, of course, is part of it. Um, but I don't think I think one recoils from the idea of of acceptance. Although you know there is there is a strand of thought in in Europe. You see it particularly in in France that that is a kind of more pessimistic, almost nihilistic view of things. The the collapsologists who say you know we're fated to you know we're at the end of this this cycle now and and we have no power to change things. I don't, that seems to me almost equally, um, childish as, as we all, as the opposite <laughs> saying that, you know, we're going to save the world. Um, I think, I think the way of thinking about it should be that there's a moral obligation for every one of us to do what we can to help improve our lot. That if we, if we care about, um, you know, any of these, these values, um, that, that shape our, our, our culture, um, that we owe it to ourselves to, um, take action. And that means, you know, individual action. It means, you know, how we spend our money. It means how we, certainly how we vote, how we organize, um, and how we see the world. And I think it, and part of that, I think has to include, um, understanding the ways in which this crisis is um, already shaping um, our our lives in profound ways and not not simply in you know in terms of uh, in insurance um, you know home insurance costs or what if we live near forests that might burn up or, or you know coasts that might flood um, things like that but I also mean in the ways that it's changing how we think about our futures how we think about uh, the future of our, our families, how we think about, you know, the ethics of a lot of decisions that we, we take for granted that we make in our daily lives about, you know, what we eat, how we travel, um, uh, you know, and, and so on. And so I think, I think understanding the, the issue in a more <clears throat> comprehensive way, you know, understanding that we live in the climate age now and that this is the lens that through which we have to understand, um, our reality. Uh, I think that's, that's a first step, you know, in other words, to talk about it honestly, not as an isolated problem, but as, um, the, the fabric of the world that we live in now, I think until we can speak honestly about it, it's hard to imagine that, um, you know, the kind of political change that, that that's really required, um, taking place. I was going to ask how you felt about, individual actions, you kind of already answered that. And I was going to paraphrase a question you posed in the book, which was just riding a bike and having a vegan diet offset the occasional airfare. Um, I, I sense right. maybe it doesn't offset the airfare, but it helps. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think there, I think if you look at it, you know, almost mathematically, um, you know, if we were all to live our best, most virtuous lives and, go vegan and, and not fly and, and all the rest. Um, yes, it would help. This is a cumulative problem, but it wouldn't be sufficient in that the kind of changes that are required are really, uh, really do require, um, polit major political, uh, decisions to be made. And, um, you know, we have to, we have to determine as a society, as a country to change the way we produce energy and consume energy. And so I think it's somewhat uh, delusional to think that, you know, if, if we're all just sort of good, if we all, you know, police our own emissions better, that that will, will save us. It won't. But on, on the other hand, I do think that there does have to develop a, a stronger ethics of, 
of uh, you know our, of our carbon um, usage. Um, you know that we have to think about our use of of carbon uh, in the same way. You know, in the same way that there's an ethics of say, you know, that we don't just throw our trash out of our windows um, or. Uh, you know, that we don't litter, um, things like that, that have become, you know, ingrained uh, in developed society. Um, I think we have to think in the same way about, about carbon emissions. Uh, in the sa- and I, and I, I do think until that, that is a bit more ingrained, until that is understood on a more intimate level by a larger percentage of the public, it's hard to imagine um, a kind of mass mobilization of, of political will uh, that that's necessary to push politicians to act. So I do think they're related. Um, but I think the other issue that you're getting at that is also really the subject of the book is, is, you know, how do we make peace with these anxieties? You know, how do we, you know, I think it's very hard to, you know, no matter, no matter our best efforts, if you're living in the West, if you're living in the U S um, you know, you're contributing an outsized share of, of, uh, carbon emissions to the, to the, you know, to the atmosphere, um, no matter what you do. Um, it's the nature of, of advanced society that it's, it's, we're completely tied into the grid in ways in you know, all kinds of ways that we don't even care to think about most of the time. And so I think if you, if you worry about this, this stuff and, and you, you know, you, to acknowledge that fact, it creates a deep uh, uneasiness, and and I and I don't uh, I feel that the literature uh, to this point hasn't done hasn't helped us to think through the, the the questions that that raises. You know, how do we think about our own com- complicity, even you know, unwilling, reluctant <laughs> complicity in this in this mess, um, and and that those you know those questions were questions that I, I hope to write about, um, through these, 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 you know, the stories of these people who were the first to really think through them, um, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and I think those are questions that, that each of us have to resolve, um, for ourselves. Um, you know, what's, what is the ethical way to live in this, this world essentially? Um, and I think that's, that's a place where I think literature and art um, has a role in helping us to to think through for for ourselves. Um, I'm just going to share something personal with you. When I was trying to listen to Elizabeth Colbert's um, field notes from a catastrophe audiobook as I drive to work, and I couldn't get through the first chapter because as I was listening to it, two days in a row I saw people throw trash out of their car while I was just stuck in traffic, and it was just so <laughs> defeating I couldn't... Uh, I just, I, my thought at the moment was if people can't even, you know, not litter, I just, it, it didn't give me a lot of hope. Um, no, just, it doesn't. Yeah. I, no, and I, I have the same kind. I mean, yes, I have that same feeling, you know, you see someone just sitting in an idling car for hours or, um, you know, I, I've had a recent obsession in my neighborhood in New Orleans where there's this uh, a cop that does patrols in the neighborhood and he just uh, just goes around over and over driving his pickup truck over and over and over and over again. And, you know, it's not a uh, electric vehicle, right? And so it's just that, you know, you can become obsessed um, with those things and it, it actually can shake your faith and you know the ability of humanity to really deal with this problem when you see people behaving so recklessly and callously and um without any thought um and so that's when i you know that that does lead me to this this idea of a you know need for a stronger ethics around this and and look as a society we have developed stronger ethics about all kinds of social issues about race um you know, about gender, about, um, uh, sexuality, um, you name it. And so I think change like that is possible, but it, it does take one, you know, acting in one's own life to do something about it in, in however limited a way, uh, that, that might be, it might mean in conversation with a stranger or, um, a letter to a local official or, um, 
changing, you know, trying to model better behavior. And it does seem sort of crazily futile in the larger scheme of things. But I think this is part of the process, part of the way that real social change happens um, over time. Uh, And so, uh, you know, on the other hand, yes, I think the major, you know, what's required are major political shifts in how we, you know, create energy and, um, you know, how we moving away from fossil fuels. But, but I do think the, this ethical side of it um, is important. And I think it is, it is connected to, to the politics on a, on a fundamental level as well. Um, I'm just curious, and this isn't something that um, is the focus of your book, and I'm not necessarily expecting you to have an answer, um, but I'm just curious. And the reason I'm asking it is because I don't see it written about too much um, in the books about climate change that I read. And it relates to overpopulation. Um, I often read about carrying capacity and the debate of should I have a kid or not, but it's never really framed in the context of just overpopulation. Um, and in my lifetime, the world population has almost doubled. And in that same time, we've released more carbon emissions since I've been alive than the combined civilized history prior to my birth. Um, I'm just curious if you have an answer as to why overpopulation isn't part of the conversation when we talk about climate change. It's a good question. It's an issue that's become taboo, um, really on the left and on the right. What's what's striking about the the, the history, of the period I wrote about. One of the things that was most striking to me was um, in 1988, when you have an enormous amount of um, you know increased awareness over climate change, and you have 32. Um, bills introduced in Congress to address climate change, you know, many of them, most of them bipartisan, um, some of the most prominent from, you know, Republicans in, in the House and in the Senate. Um, some of those bills, uh, which were in many ways more ambitious than what now, you know, is being proposed with the, in the Green New Deal, um, some of those bills did have population control um, Sections. In fact, the two the two largest ones, um, one in the Senate, one in the House. Uh, the House from a Republican named Claudine Schneider um, from Rhode Island. Uh, the Senate from uh, Tim Worth, senator from uh, Colorado, Democrat. Uh, they had um, major population control uh, planks, and it tended to be something, some combination of um, money for family planning. Uh, particularly in the developing world, um, and even uh, I think sanctions on on countries that failed to take enough um, measures um, to to uh, limit population um, growth. Um, Alan Weissman is a is a very interesting writer who has written a a book about this more recently called countdown. Um, and, you know, I think there are people who are certainly concerned about it, but there, there's also a, a legacy of, um, you know, a kind of disillusionment with this issue from dating back <coughs> to the population bomb, um, in Paul Ehrlich's book in the 1970s that, you know, was a created a big public, scare about the issue um, that was later sort of solved by major advances in agricultural techniques <laughs> and fertilizers um, that seemed to make it not seem like a you know problem basically for the next few decades. Um, but certainly it's a con- concern, um, you know, population increases in the developing world combined with those countries' uh, modernization and, you know, escape from abject poverty um, into, you know, into the modern world, that, 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 that's the major source of increased uh, emissions in the decades, and it will be in the decades to come. Um, but yeah, there's very little appetite to engage that issue politically, um, certainly in, in the U.S. Um, and more generally in the West, where, where actually population growth is, is slowing in, in many countries. 
Yeah, I mean, the short, the short answer is yes, that's a big part. That's a part of the problem. But I think, uh, you know, I think it's the idea is if you, if you can transition to a renewable economy, then that becomes less of a major problem. But it, but I think, um, yes, that's, there's a mathematical aspect to this where, you know, the more people, the, the more emissions. Yeah, and you kind of touched on it when you said um, that the solution years ago for the carrying capacity was fertilizer and bigger agriculture, but that is, as you also noted, um, a major contributor to the emissions problem now. Right. I mean, the other thing is to, to just emphasize is that the emissions um, you know, it, are not even, so you could add now I'm totally making up numbers, but it might be, you know, one one new child in California um, over their lifetime might be the equivalent of 100 children in some developing country or 1,000 or 10,000 children. Um, so to blame it simply, you know, to blame the developing countries simply on, um, you know, the population numbers increasing is is a bit misleading. and And I think a lot of you know, environmentalists would say that's um, deflecting blame from the real uh, villains, uh, you know, which are those in the West who are, um, you know, in- increasing emissions and and uh, forcing, you know, into production all of these, these fossil fuel uh, plants all over the place when they're not required, when they're not needed. Borrowed Time is a collaborative effort by librarians to combat climate change by discussing sustainability issues and all things related to the human influence on our ecosystem. For more episodes, visit borrowed-time.org.